back, collectors. Today we're going to talk about the 1966 Batman Utility Belt set by Idea. It is uh, Holy Grail Vintage Batman Toys. For decades I was obsessed with this toy. I owned a total of 21 sets, 18 for a long time. And in addition, the Prototype Factory Test Shot set in mock-up box. Originally this box came sealed. You're looking at the April 16th, 1966 Toys and Novelties magazine cover. It happens to be made the back cover to the second edition of Batman Collected. Here you see the box has a, a gloss sheen. You wouldn't get that shine from the box alone. Um, it's a very dry matte finish. Another Batman collector named Alan Daniels. This is his example. It's not a factory seal, but he had it shrink wrapped. And see how it's crunching the box inward that small bridge across at the bottom you want to get rid of that plastic because the box wasn't designed to handle it long term i couldn't locate the image proving that there's no glue trail on the underside of the lid it was on this box i sold to a collector named marcus arbala they installed windows afterwards there was an old man, he's got to be going by now. I met him in KB Toy Works nearly 30 years ago. Well, he owned three factory sealed examples. A longtime toy dealer who's still around. And murder victim Ben Novak Jr., who was a Batman collector, knew who this old man was. Here you're looking at pages from the Ideal Catalog. There's the main graphic to the window box. This page shows a prototype. Also notice the belt is rubber. Here's my prototype test shot set. Notice that graphic is the same as on the Ideal Catalog, only flipped. Notice the belt is in white rubber, the same as this figure here. They cast it in white rubber or translucent white or opaque white. Parts share the same provenance. Here I'm holding up a translucent hard plastic belt half to compare to a milky white rubber test shot. You'll find this image online. I actually own five pictured here. Some of them are the same. Top images of a really rare Australian version. It was listed on eBay until <coughs> Craig Warren had it shut down after making a false determination of it on the 1966 Batman message board where he badmouthed it just like he did his customers. But he was an expert on Batman 60s items. But he wasn't. The owner wound up losing money consigning to Morphe Auction House, where it only sold for 5000 He was embarrassed when I pointed out how he was wrong to deem the Aussie set a fake. The record sale for an ideal utility belt involves him, actually. He sold one privately to a guy named Peter Lutrario, a millionaire in Florida, who came on to the 66 Batman message board. Put a feeler out looking for an ideal belt, and someone laughed, and he responded with, I'll have you know I own a Tech 27, then Warren took advantage of By it. selling him this example, which he paid 3900 for, he sold it to him for 26500 and the guy flew Warren to Florida for the cash exchange. The guy wound up quitting the hobby and struggled to sell it for 10k. This example sold for $16,662.62 November of 2007 on eBay. The following week this set sold for $8,000 on eBay. The winner was Ben Novak Jr. and it was auctioned in 2012 for this through Heritage. Cakes Americana sold this example in 2013 for a little over 8k. Went to Ireland to back in Canada. I sold this example the night Adam West passed away on eBay. Here's a better look. This is the first issue box that didn't come issued with a window. Previous owner Mike Carver made rice paper overlays. Sometimes the box can actually look like they have overlays depending on the degree of coloring in the ink when the box is printed. This is my first set. This is the example that was featured on the TV show Pawn Stars. Figured I'd tell this story within this video. The year before the episode aired, this very example was offered on eBay by a guy named Chuck with I sold it in Arizona. I was the underbidder at 10k. It sold to longtime toy dealer Joel McGee, who I did business with. 
He became Rick Harrison's friend in the shop's Disney Anna expert, which is why the set was featured on the show. This lady lied to the world, that's TV. Before I figured out what example it was, immediately called the shop and offered them 14K. They countered at 15. I was more focused on comics at the time. And then they blew up my phone. And then by the time I called them back, Chumley answered and I said, Chumley. And he hung up on me, I guess because he doesn't like to be called that name that he has to live with. I identified the set from this litho tear on the side panel. The set finally sold this past January 2021 with Von Eaton Gallery. They claimed it was a record sale, but they weren't aware of the private sales that took place because another sold for 20k. And another in 2010 sold for 23300 Notice the copyright information by Batman's foot is different and the coloring can be lighter or darker. Um, also, the box base has no stamp and some of the components are different from the U.S. issue. The Australian box actually lacks all the stamp markings at the base. It's just plain white, which is the sole reason that so-called 60s Batman toy expert Craig Warren had that guy's listing taken down. Because U.S. boxes had these stamp markings and this serial number can be slightly altered. And the ink came in black, Navy blue, red, or pink. In 2014, this empty box surfaced on eBay, and it was cheap. Um, the seller had poor communication, but explained that it had been found in an abandoned ice cream truck, and mice were living in it, which explains some of the damage. It resurfaced in 2020 and sold again. This is a side panel of the box base. Here's your side panel of the lid. And there's your logo and the ideal symbol. One of the ways of identifying an authentic box is you look for the tiny pixelations of pink around the orange on the insert tray. This is an all original overseas variation. This is the equipment set version that comes in a huge solid box. This is the same toy in a mailer box. With the equipment set, you get the helmet and cape. It's combined with a utility belt. The way to identify a belt as having come from an equipment box is it wouldn't have the staple holes here on the side. Also, the plastic is more flexible, less crackable. The plastic loop that was meant to hold the bat rope for the grappling hook wasn't very flexible and they had the tendency to crack. But don't get confused because later, Ideal started splicing them off, as you see right here, and then they used a third metal clip and did a hole punch here. And these clips can come in either silver or gold. And on the side, they have what looks like a cross engraved. Here's the front to the US instruction sheet. And here's an overseas instruction sheet. It shows the metal flashlight. Now on to the many different slight variations of what Ideal Toy Corp called the dummy transmitter or bat radio. They can be found loose sometimes. Made of sturdy tin foil, variants are all to do with a fake screen behind the bat. This one has the tiny beads. This one almost is perforated. It's the square version. And this one is a, of a different pattern. It's almost sort of scattered texture. And this one is checkerboard. And this one is actually made of paper and it comes from Australia. Here's another one. It's overseas. This one came from Batman collector Ralph Garman. It might be a one-off. I've only ever seen one. The screen is unique. They got the front right, but um, it is a reproduction. This is the common repro from Paul Shapiro in Illinois. They have no three-dimensional texture and they photograph black. And of course, the front is wrong, as well as the back. The grappling hook often came missing one of the prongs. They broke easily, likely from kids trying to use this low-tech gear. 
and often can be found with chew marks as well. The way to identify an original bat rope is to look for the gray twine twisted inside of the coil. Bat rope can often be found with a lot of fraying as you see here from Playware and it came with a very distinctive looking metal clasp that pinches both sides of the rope through the hook hoop. They're often found rusted too. The following are two examples of unplayed with bat ropes. They're more gleaming white and you can just tell they have a very fresh appearance. And from the way that they're wrapped, let's talk back cuffs. The middle chain link is an S-shaped in the US, but over in Australia, it is an incursive E here. These are from Argentina, many exposes. This is a Plastirama licensed, carded with different chain link and made in silvery gray. And here's a foreign blister carded vintage pair of bootleg back cuffs, same as the ideal, put out with an offbeat gun. Standard US back cuffs are going to have this copyright information on it. Copyright 1966 National Periodical Publications Incorporated Ideal Toy Corp. They're pretty common to find actually, and, and really beautiful on their own. But I'd say, uh, for my taste anyway, uh, the most beautiful component to the set is the Batarang. In 07, Chris Vaughn of Red Venom Repros reproduced a slew of parts from the set. Here was an old inventory list. He doesn't do it anymore. He had a $100 limit, and um, he said he doesn't need the money. You can tell from the plastic, the newness of it, the difference between a real and a fake. Um, and the darts, they don't cure. Um, he doesn't give them time to cure, or they just won't. Over time, they're going to curl on those dark projectiles. I loan him the grappling hook and the Australian instruction sheet, which is much more rare than the U.S. So he makes both. He shelved the idea to make the back cuffs, but Uncle Al's toys makes them. You can tell they're fake from the gold round washer and the sheen, the newness of the plastic. Dan Dozier of Toy Tent, he often offers the grappling hook and as authentic, and it's not, um, but whatever. I, mean, I can identify parts from a mile away. The back gun launcher actually comes from the 1962 Ideal King Zor toy dart gun. They made it in this bright lime green. Sometimes they gave the back gun this tomato red trigger. And like the overseas examples of the back gun, it had this orange holes sprayed in, whereas the Batman had black. Notice the circular ridges at the start of this barrel on the Zora gun and all the other Batman guns are present, but they're missing from my prototype test shot gun. It's always made me wonder that they were going to alter it. Now I'm going to show you two Australian bat gun launchers. Notice the bat is much wider. Note the airbrushed black holes. They didn't make it like this in the US. Note the differences in the airbrushed bat. US, UK, Australia. In this print ad from Sears, the kid looks like he's going to hurl a Batman message sender without the gun launcher. Let's talk about the dart bombs, these two projectiles for the gun. So I mentioned that in this catalog page, it displays a prototype bat rocket grenade. Well, this is the one that I own in my test shot set which has a much smaller cap bomb head than the one issued. The bat rocket grenade can either use these pressure caps, which are harder to find, or regular rolled paper caps. The dart shafts came in either this dark orange or black. Black is nicer in my opinion because the orange is a, 
a leftover idea from the King Zora toy, and also most of the components are black plastic, so it's better to match. What you're looking at here are two original Batman message senders with original grenade tops and original dart shafts, and one of those stems is shorter. Well, that is because it is from the UK. It's overseas. And if you want to look at another one, you can see it in Chip Kid's book, Batman Collected. In his utility belt example, he has the more rare, shorter dart stem. These were so notorious for breaking that sometimes Ideal would issue a third spare shaft in sets. In fact, that's where this one came from. I had first dibs on the original box set that went to Batcat in Thailand. This set belongs to a collector who they call Little Arty Clothes. It has an all red dark projectile, but I've never seen one and I think that's gotta be fake. One of the many flashlights this set was issued with is the translucent white vinyl generic flashlight that was with my factory test shot. Um, I know it's kind of boring, it's so plain. I like to sometimes switch up parts because um, that set is so void of color. This was cost cutting for Ideal instead of using aluminum and having an airbrushed battle. Since this style of light was with the other color test shot parts, it's evidence that they were thinking about doing this all along. But at first we got the metal lights. But while I'm on this vinyl light, I'll show you the different variety of colors you can get these in. And I've never seen another white one. Most commonly you'll find red, yellow, and blue. This is the more darker blue now. There's lime green. This is the lighter blue, which also came issued with the utility belt. Here's proof. Here's a print ad from 1966. See the light blue? Here's a non-functioning dummy of that same variety light. You could get this working light, though, in a variety of colors on this card in the 60s. In yellow, light blue, lime green, red. This is another style generic light. This is the hard plastic square body with translucent cap an aluminum switch. Here's a vintage candid photo. You can see the kid with this light, which also came in red, blue, and green. The Heritage Auctions sold this in 2003. It had that green light. Here's another generic light you'll find with the utility belt sometimes. In the 70s, NASA made this Super Friends play light. It's very similar. This is the very first metal light, solid body. To turn it off, you had to remove the battery. The stub that the ball chain runs through is not made into a push button yet. It was very short lived, then they switched to the push button versions. Another hyper rare Batman item that that so called expert was totally dumbfounded about. None of the bat signal flashes ever issued with a utility belt projected a bat signal or bat symbol. At the top, Hong Kong will be engraved. And the connector to the ball chain will actually say ball chain. And there should be 32 balls to that chain. Here's the second issue push button metal light version. Notice how the button sinks into the body. The bat symbol on the US metal lights comes from the ideal Batman cape. All the metal lights are rare. The most commonly found is the lavender purple cap. And then much more rare is the red cap and then the black. There was never a blue cap and no flashlight ever issued with the ideal utility belt had a decal, aluminum or otherwise. That was a false rumor started by a Batman collector named Scott Fleming back in the 90s. You're looking at a rare Australian metal flashlight. It's the same as the US, only the emblem is different. It comes from the decals from the Captain Action Batman and Super Queen's back row. 
this is a reproduction. Um, these lights were found in 2007 on eBay. Uh, it was like a dime store find. And they were just plain aluminum lights. Very similar, but the cap is not exactly the same as an original. It's not cut the same. Here's the color variety for the metal light caps. Lavender purple, red, and black. These are the 1966 Argentinian Plastirama version of the Ideal Batman card game. And they depict a German Luger with this batty revolver, which is the same style gun they use for the utility belt. This is the Argentina Batman utility belt set, all in separate parts, individually mint in package. They also issued this batty bumerang with Robin's R patch cellophane to this card. These are some of the reproduction boxed examples that I have had. I'll leave you with these images. Really stacked up at so many near complete sets or just totally all original complete sets. And just bought reproduction boxes from different sources. And you, these are the ones you're seeing. I was consulted with to improve the reproduction boxes with a guy named Paul Shapiro in Illinois um, and made sure they were produced in matte finish and even supplied graphics from an original box. I had him make me a one-off of the box in blue because I thought that it should have been blue when I was much younger before I ever seen an original. And I actually had a dream about it that I found it in, in some old lady's cellar. It doesn't look like this now because I'm always changing parts around. The mixing and matching process for me is, is a ton of fun. And it's actually how I was able to bring myself to selling any of the sets that I collected over the years and put together. I seen this a few years back on eBay. Someone masterfully made this. This is a pure custom and it's just stunning. Thought I would share it. Back in 2008 on eBay, I commissioned this lady to produce this mini dollhouse size version of the toy. And I think she still sells them to this day. That's it for this video. If you've watched to the end, you've been great. I've been real.